Okay, hey, um, to answer your question, uh, the perimeter of San Francisco is 28 miles. Perimeter of Manhattan is about 34 miles. You can do it in a day, it's really fun. I highly recommend it. And a quick plug, I am doing a San Francisco perimeter walk later this year. If anyone wants to join me, let me know. But I'm not here to talk about that. I'm here to talk about baking accessibility into your design systems. So a little more about me, um, wow, um, I am, in an accessibility specialist at Dropbox by day. By night, I am pursuing my master's in comics. I'm almost done with it, so super excited about that. Um, I'm also super excited about this slide because I have this illustration of myself that's like maybe four real life Cordelia's tall. So if anyone wants to take a photo of me next to it, I'd love to send that to my mom because she would just love this. So anyway, this is a slide for you to take a photo of me. Um, and now let's talk about accessibility because that's why I'm here. Um, so what is accessibility? Accessibility is basically creating experiences that everyone can use regardless of their abilities. So if someone, so if we're speaking about web, for instance, and that's what we're mostly talking about today, if someone is blind, if someone has color blindness, if someone has hearing loss, or you know, has a dexterity issue that affects how they use websites, they're still able to use, and not just use, but enjoy all of the same products that people um, who may not have those conditions um, can use. Um, if accessibility is done correctly, then you have created a really flexible system that considers people with disabilities from the very beginning. So rather than tacking on accommodations, an accessible system includes them in that design process, in the development process, and creates a system that is flexible enough for people to kind of figure out whatever um, way they want to perform an action. So the user has choice and is able to pick the one that works best for them. So let's talk a little bit about what happens when accessibility isn't baked in by default. And for that, I'm going to use metaphor because we all love metaphor here at ClarityConf um, and talk about baking muffins for your niece's birthday party. So you're really excited, you baked these delicious muffins and on the screen here I have an illustration of a muffin because I'm a cartoonist. Um, you've made these really great muffins they taste great, you're super excited to bring them to your niece's birthday party, and on your way there, your mom is like, oh wait, but I think that you were supposed to make blueberry muffins, those are her favorite. And you're like, holy guacamole, I forgot to put blueberries in these muffins, what am I gonna do? So you start frantically shoving blueberries into the muffin with your bare hands, and it's a mess, and it's gross, and you end up with this kind of gross looking muffin. So this is technically a blueberry muffin. It is a muffin with blueberries in it. But it's not really the same as a blueberry muffin with the blueberries in by default. You know, they're not kind of melted and delicious. It looks disastrous because it's crumbling everywhere. There's like blue juice all over the place. It's just not a good experience. So by definition, yes, it is a blueberry muffin. And, and yes, for example, you may have an accessible system that passes accessibility requirements, but it's not a good system. Um, so why am I talking to you about blueberry muffins? Um, I believe that you all are the Julia Child of design systems. You are the chef duff of component libraries. You are the people who are creating the cookbooks that everyone else reads. You're creating the systems that everyone else wants to use, whether within your internal organization or you know, outside on the web. We've talked a lot about Bootstrap over the past few days, so everyone uses Bootstrap. Bootstrap is like this awesome cookbook um, it's like a Martha Stewart cookbook. Everyone knows that it's good because Martha Stewart made it, you know, so people will use it. Um, the reason that I wanted to give this talk today is actually because a lot of people copy and paste code, as Steph mentioned. I'd love for um, if you are a developer and you learned how to write front-end code by looking at other people's code samples, copying them, and pasting them, if you could just clap, that would be great. Anyone? Okay. That's how I learned how to write front-end code, and I learned by Googling things. For example, here I've got Google search for hamburger menu code. Um, so many of us probably don't like hamburger menus. I don't really like them, especially because they don't look like hamburgers. Um, but anyway, you can do a Google search for hamburger menu code. You can get about 600,000 results, and I'm willing to bet that probably 80% of them aren't accessible. And so a bunch of people are gonna go to the web and copy those, those code recipes, and they work really well with a mouse or on a touch screen, but they don't communicate anything to, say, someone who's navigating with a keyboard or someone who's navigating with a screen reader. And my, my analogy to recipes is kind of falling apart, but this, in the same way that you would go online and search for a cookie recipe and probably 
pick like the Martha Stewart recipe or the one from the Food Network because it's guaranteed to be good. Um, people are going to go to the web and pick your code samples because they're guaranteed to be good. So people want to use your recipes, and we have to make sure that we're giving them the best recipes we can. We've talked a lot over the past few days about consumers of style guides and those being like designers and developers, but this is really about the users at the end of the day. So we wanna make the best recipes that work for the largest amount of people, um, which reminds me to talk a little bit about universal design. So increasingly in the accessibility community, we're actually talking less about the word accessibility and more about this idea of universal design, which again is this concept of not putting accessibility in as a line item, like a box to check when you're making a component, but thinking about users with disabilities or users who are aging or users who have needs that might be different from your own, thinking about those users from the very, very beginning of the process and baking that information in when you're designing. Um, I went to this huge accessibility conference last week, and I would say like half of the sessions that I went to were about universal design. So on the screen here, I've got a tweet where I was saying, um, the big theme of this conference, CSUN, uh, was the importance of universal design. You can change underlying code to be more accessible, but it won't fix bad UX. And it got a lot of retweets and likes, and I'm not showing that to be like, wow, my tweet was really popular, but like, wow, a lot of people agreed with that, um, that accessibility is more than just writing good code. It's about building really comprehensive systems. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how to build those systems. Our agenda for today's cooking class is three different things. We're gonna go over the foundational ingredients of accessibility. Um, so that's going to be making accessible code. Then we're going to talk about the, what I would call the sugar spice and everything nice, which is all of the elements of your design system that are unique to your system and how to think about accessibility there. And finally, we'll talk about how to share those recipes and the importance of documentation. So let's talk about foundational ingredients. Um, what is the flour, the water, the butter, all of the things that are kind of standard across component systems that make them accessible. And a lot of this is about HTML. Use semantic HTML. If you're not familiar with it, um, if you're not familiar with what semantic HTML is, it's basically using HTML the way it was intended. Um, so if you have a heading on your page, if you have large text that kind of starts off a section, use an actual um, like HTML heading rather than using a span and styling it to look large. If you have tabular data, use an actual table instead of using a bunch of different, a bunch of divs that are styled to look like a table. So this is really good code practice in general for front end development. It makes your code really clean, but it's also essential um, for users of assistive technology. Um, assistive technology is any sort of technology that people that kind of exists as a layer between your website and the person who's trying to use it. Um, some examples of it are screen readers, for instance. If you're blind or low vision or have um, a cognitive impairment, you might use a screen reader to interact with the web. And the screen reader relies on elements being marked up correctly. So a screen reader needs to know that, hey, this element is a button because it's an actual HTML button. Um, so speaking of buttons, my first best practice for you all is to use actual buttons in your um, component libraries. And here I'm talking specifically to folks who are making style guides that have code samples online that people can copy and paste. Because my goal here is that all of the code samples that we put out as style in style guides are accessible by default. So if people are copying and pasting that code, they are guaranteed to copy and paste good code. So here on the screen, I've got my sample style guide. I've got a primary button and a secondary button. They look like buttons, and the underlying HTML for them is button class equals button dash dash primary. So this is great. It's an HTML button, and it looks like a button. But I've also seen a lot of style guides that will use an anchor there instead. So now I've got an anchor with class equals button dash dash primary. And the, and the actual components look exactly the same, but the markup is a little different. It still works the same with a mouse, but it's not actually going to be reachable via keyboard because an anchor element without an href is not keyboard accessible. Um, when you create these kinds of when you create CSS classes like button dash dash primary, it kind of gives people license to use that on any old element they want. So here I've got the same exact 
visual element, it is a primary button, it looks like a button, but in the HTML, it's actually a div with class button dash dash primary, and that div has an on click event. So this looks like a button, it acts like a button to a mouse user, but a keyboard user isn't gonna be able to get to it, and a screen reader user isn't gonna be able to get to it or, action, or take action on it. Um, so I'd highly recommend, and maybe this is controversial, I don't really delve too much into CSS, but if you are creating a button class, maybe in your CSS style sheets, make sure that that button class is only applied to actual HTML buttons, because that ensures that people can't just stick it on any old div um, and make something inaccessible. So make sure your buttons are actually buttons. The second big tip on accessible, on accessible web development is input fields. Um, a big trend right now that I'm hoping is going away is to stick input field labels inside of input fields. So here I've got a text field on the page and in gray letters inside the text field it says favorite animal. Um, the code for it is input type equals text, placeholder equals favorite animal. Um, so there are a few different accessibility issues with this code sample. For one thing, um, it's really low contrast. If I have low vision, I might not even see this text. If we made that text darker, it would look like a filled in field. The other issue is that if I start typing in there, the label completely goes away. That's a huge issue for people with cognitive impairments. It's a huge issue if you start typing in there and you get distracted because there are a million things going on um, and you go back and you're like, oh man, I don't even know why I typed lemurs in here. What is this field? Um, so make sure to always include a visible label. So here I've got a visible label above my field, it says favorite animals, and below it, it's, I've replaced the placeholder text with leaping lemurs. And I've seen this particular code sample a lot in style guides, where I've got a label in the HTML followed by an input field. So this looks like it's right, but it's actually not right, because there's no association between the label and the input field in the code. Um, there's nothing telling a screen reader, for instance, hey, this label is associated with this input field. It's not enough that they be right next to each other. So make sure that when you are including form code samples in your style guides, and I've seen a lot of these, and I've seen a lot of them done right, but a lot of them also done wrong, to include a for attribute in your label. So here I'm saying this is a label for the animal field, and I'm saying the input has ID equals animal. And that ensures that a screen reader user will know that this is the favorite animal input field. It also adds a benefit for mouse users where if I click on the label, my focus will now immediately go into the input field. Um, I'm not gonna dwell too much on alternative text for images because I wanna get to some juicy stuff like color, which is very controversial in accessibility, um, but give any image that you put on your website alternative text. This is really important for iconography. I think Nathan last yesterday was saying like iconography is super important to style guides. So every time you have an icon in your style guide, you should include some alternative text for it. If it's a standalone icon, you want to include text that conveys its meaning. So here I've got this green house icon, and I have a few different possible code snippets for it. It could have, it could be an image with alt equals home if this were, say, like an icon in you know navigation at the bottom of the page, and this takes me home. If I'm on like a you know, plant website, I might want it to have alt equals greenhouse, so it kind of depends on context, but make sure to include a text alternative for people who can't see that image. Um, if you have images next to text, you also want to include a text alternative for them. You want to convey to screen readers, this is an image that isn't important because it's already conveyed via text. So here, um, I've got the same little house icon next to the word home. Um, and I can just say, if it's an image in the HTML, I can say alt equals empty string. That's like, hey, screen reader, ignore this, in this image. It's not important. If I were using SVGs, for instance, I might use aria hidden equals true that says, again, like screen reader, ignore this image because there's going to be other text on the screen. If you have decorative images, I would say the alternative text is at your own discretion. So here I've got like two samples of my like intro slide where I've got the one with like 
an illustration of me, and the second one, I've replaced that illustration of me with a bunch of like decorative little circles. So in the first one, I think that this is a decorative image. It doesn't need to be there to convey like who I am, but I think it adds a little bit extra info about like the type of person I am. Hey, I like comics. So there I would probably include an alt of like illustration of Cordelia grinning, wearing a chef's hat and stirring batter, because that is what's happening in that illustration. I wouldn't want to put an alt for like a bunch of decorative circles, because I just don't think that's very meaningful information. So I'm just going to put alt equals empty string there. So make sure every time you include an image that you either put helpful text there or convey somehow that it's not useful text or it's not important to know that information. In some cases, you may need to use ARIA um, in addition to semantic HTML. So ARIA stands for Accessible Rich Internet Applications. It's a series of um, HTML attributes that you can add to a, an element to convey its role, state, and properties to assistive technology. And we talked a little, I think a few talks yesterday mentioned ARIA. So some examples of that, here I've got um, 18F's uh, design stand, or web design standards for the US government um, on the screen and I've got their accordion component. So there, there are accordions of the First Amendment, Second Amendment, Third Amendment, et cetera, and the first one is expanded and the rest are collapsed. So this is all conveyed visually, right? Like we have little pluses and minuses. We can tell the First Amendment is open and the other ones aren't. But if we couldn't see the screen, how would we know that information? There isn't an easy way to do that just with standard like semantic HTML. So you can include ARIA attributes to say, hey, this first one is ARIA expanded equals true. The others are ARIA expanded equals false. You can use ARIA to associate the headers with their corresponding content. And it's really exciting because the style guide does it and they actually include documentation about how to do that correctly. Um, so use ARIA whenever you have like modals, menus, accordions, tabs, anything that is kind of has this functionality or purpose that can't be conveyed through semantic HTML alone. Um, I just threw a lot of information at you and I only kind of scratched the surface of accessible web development. So I wanted to share a few resources with you. Um, the first is the WCAG 2.0 guidelines. These are the accessibility standards that most websites are trying to meet if they're thinking about accessibility. Um, Hayden is a super cool guy who I bet a bunch of you know. Um, he's created these practical ARIA examples, which are little code snippets so you can apply to make, say, an accessible accordion or an accessible tab set with really minimal amounts of code. And finally, there's a web accessibility Slack community, which is web-a11y.slack. Um, and the people in that community are super, super open to newcomers. We all just sit around and chat about accessibility best practices there, and I highly recommend you join us. Um, so that's kind of the core HTML components, but let's talk a little bit more about design, the sugar and spice and everything nice, the branding of your products and how you can think about how accessibility works into that. Um, you know, on the screen here, I've got an illustration of like agave nectar and honey to kind of illustrate that you are making choices, right? You're making choices about what colors you want to use, what animations you want to use. Um, and when you're making those choices, you should think a little bit about accessibility and it's part of the process. So the first thing I'd encourage you to do is to make keyboard interactions as rich as mouse interactions. So a lot of people aren't navigating with a mouse, they're navigating with a keyboard, they might be navigating with a switch control, even with a head mouse, I tried one of those out recently. There are a lot of really interesting ways that people are interacting with your product. And it doesn't really matter like what, to, what technology they're using, right? You want to provide a fun experience for everyone. And I think Rachel touched on this earlier today where she was talking about um, creating an animation that appears both on hover and on focus. And that's what I'd encourage you to do is think about keyboard users and don't leave them behind when you're like generating fun stuff on hover. Um, so I'm going to show an example of Facebook reactions. Maybe you love them, maybe you hate them, but they now exist in Facebook. When you, when you hover over the like button on a post, you get this animation of these reactions popping up. Um, and when you hover over each one of them, they each kind of jump a little bit. So I'm going to show an animation of that here. Um, and I think this is like a nice, fun interaction that Facebook introduced recently to their product. But they went a step further and they made sure that it's also keyboard accessible. So now I'm doing that same interaction 
with my keyboard. I'm using my arrow keys to navigate back and forth between all the different reactions. And I thought that was really, really great because they're trying to provide a fun experience regardless of how people are experiencing their website. The one problem I'd say with this, or the one thing that's a little bit clunky with keyboard is those focus halos that you may have seen. So let's talk a little bit about focus halos. Don't forget about them. A lot of times, people don't like the default focus halo that appears on buttons and input fields and anything that's focusable. So on the screen here, I've got this little heart button, and I've put a focus indicator around it. A lot of times, people find this really ugly, and they get rid of it, which is super bad for people who are navigating via keyboard, because then they have no idea where they are. They don't have a benefit of a cursor moving around, so they rely on focus indicators. So it's totally fine to get rid of this like ugly, default blue halo as long as you try something else. So here are just some examples I came up with yesterday. I'm sure designers in the audience can probably come up with things that are even more visually appealing than this. But you could create your own focus halo around here. And this is a really good time to like infuse your brand into the keyboard and interactions of your product. So here I've put like a purple border around it. Here I've put a purple border around my button and I've included a tooltip Oftentimes, people only make tooltips that appear on hover, but those should also appear on focus because people oftentimes won't know to hover on this thing, but they will tab past it. Here, I've created a rounded um, border around it. So there are a lot of ways to um, incorporate your particular aesthetics and your particular branding into accessible features like focus halos. Here is another example. I actually think all of these are ugly. so. My apologies, I came up with these yesterday. Um, but here is that same button um, with the word love next to it. And here are some like random samples of things that you could do instead of the default halo. You could change that default halo to be red. You could underline the text and make it bold. You could even add, this is pretty ugly, I apologize. It is, you could add a really ugly scroll behind the button on focus. The point is that you are thinking about keyboard interactions and infusing your brand into that in the same way that you might think about mouse interactions. So now let's talk about color. And I think color is like the hardest thing to get behind when you're thinking about accessibility and design because people don't want to like escape from, or people are wary of deviating from their branding. People are scared that if they're using accessible color palettes, they're going to have like black text on white everywhere on the page, and it's going to be really monochrome and ugly. But I'd like to hopefully like debunk that here. Um, so there are two color rules for accessibility. There are a few other ones, but these are the main ones. The first is that you should maintain a reasonable contrast ratio between text and background colors. And the second is that you shouldn't use color alone to convey meaning. So that's just two rules you need to follow. Let's talk about that first one, which is reasonable contrast ratios. So the WCAG 2.0 guidelines that I talked about earlier um, have these like specific ratios for text size or for text color against background color. So it's 4.5 to 1 for regular text, 3 to 1 for large text. Those numbers don't really mean anything here out of context. So I recommend you use an online tool to test how your colors work against that. There are a lot of tools available. Um, I really like Wave, which is a um, accessibility assessment tool made by this group called WebAIM. And so you can test your entire website's accessibility, not just color contrast, but lots of other stuff. Um, so I think, again, people are are worried that making things high contrast means that they're going to be ugly. Um, I would say that is totally untrue. So here is colorsafe.co, which is a tool made by two great people at Salesforce. Um, and it basically generates accessible color palettes for you. So I have said, I want a large color text against a white background. Um, I want it to be slightly in the red, purple, spectrum. It's a lot more vibrant on my screen here, but here you can see there are like some really bright magentas and reds and purples. So all of these are accessible colors to use against white. Um, so you can definitely find colors within, say, your company's branding that work. Um, 
And it's totally fine to create a color palette that isn't fully accessible. So here I've got on the screen Scooter, which is a CSS framework that Dan Eden has been making for Dropbox. Um, and here is the grayscale color palette. So there are 10 different shades of gray here. And I know everyone likes making things really light gray on white, which is really hard for me to see. So, so he's got these like 10 gray colors in his grayscale palette. And the top five, the darkest ones, have a little check that says WCAG 2.0 compliant. If someone were looking at this style guide and being like, what does that mean? He has conveniently added um, some documentation at the top to say, hey, if these things have a check mark that says WCAG 2.0 compliant, you can use these colors against, for text against a white background. Um, so it's not that you can't use the other colors, it's just that you shouldn't use them for text. You can use all these grays for borders, you can use them as background colors for other types of text. There's a lot of different ways to use color that isn't just text. Um, and this is just scrolling further down the page, we can see the larger color palette for Scooter. I would say about a third of these colors are, um, you, can be used for text. The rest of them can definitely be used for a lot of other things. Um, so I would say use vibrant colors as much as you can and use light colors. Just make sure that you are using dark colors for text and using those other bright colors elsewhere. So here I've got like a cake that I drew. Um, it says clarity in big bold uh, purple letters on top of it. You may or may not, depending on um, where you're sitting, be able to see that there are also like green bits of icing and blue bits of icing, but those aren't the important information. The important information is conveyed in high contrast text. I think, another plug for Lightning Design System, I think Lightning does this really well. Um, so here is the home page of the Lightning Design System. You can see that they are using a lot of bright colors, like this is a bright, friendly website. Um, they're using a blue that passes for their background color here with white text. And then they've, they're using color in other interesting, innovative ways. So they've got these decorative images on the side. I'm not sure what they're like in the code, but those decorative images would probably have alternative text um, set to empty string or aria hidden because they're kind of these like floating objects. Um, if you scroll down the page, you can see these different tiles talking about the lightning design systems um, underlying uh, like the tenants of this system. Um, and if we look at trustworthiness, the color palette for trustworthiness is yellow, which is traditionally a very, very hard color to make pass for contrast. If you're trying to write yellow text on white, you have to like make it really dark and ugly and brown. So they're not putting yellow text on white. What they're doing is they are using a yellow outline in some places, they're using yellow for their iconography, and they're keeping all of their text a dark blue. So there are a lot of ways to use vibrant colors that aren't conveying meaning. Um, the second rule of color contrast is use more than just color for meaning. So this one, I hope, is a pretty simple one to get behind. Um, so here I've got an example of some input fields, and the first field, uh, the first name field, is a required field that wasn't filled out. And so it's got a red border around it. So this is problematic for people who may have low vision um, or who are colorblind who may not notice that red. A really easy way to check this is to put your website in grayscale mode. In, in OS X, it's really easy to enable grayscale mode. And you can see right now I've got my first name field with a dark gray border and my last name field with a light gray border. And I don't know, suddenly I don't know that the first name field is required. So include some extra additional information there. So this is an example from Scooter again, uh, Dropbox's component system. And you can see the first name field now also has an icon. It has explicit text saying it's required. It's still putting all that stuff in red. Um, so it's still using color to help convey meaning, but it's not relying on color to convey meaning. So if I then were to put this page in grayscale mode, I can still tell that this field is required because I've got this icon with an exclamation point, I've got the required text. Um, so I highly recommend checking out grayscale mode. I use it a lot, actually. I just navigate in grayscale mode for fun because I feel like it. Um, so finally, um, we've talked a little bit about 
how to make your code accessible, and how to think about accessibility when designing. We've only kind of scratched the surface, but those are some really big areas to think about it. The final step is sharing your recipes. If you've done all the work to make your component system and your design system accessible, you should share that. And I think um, Steph and Brandon talked a lot about this yesterday and the importance of documentation. Um, so clap if you have heard of or are a fan of Pinterest fails. Anyone? Yay, Pinterest fails, okay. Um, so if you're not familiar with Pinterest fails, it's basically people go on the internet and they see these really great tutorials, like do-it-yourself tutorials on Pinterest, and they try them out, and it's a total flop. So like here I've got this like collection of cake pops that look like little baby chicks. They're super cute, they're super great. Someone tried to recreate this recipe that they found on Pinterest, and they ended up with this gross thing. Um, <laughs> So here we've got this like totally mutilated looking cake pop. It's like the icing is all over the place. The like fro the there are sprinkles that are weirdly placed. It's against this like really ugly wooden table and, and the caption, which is very low contrast I might add, says nailed it. Um, so this is something that happens when that happens a lot when you see these sort of image tutorials online that don't really spell out all of the steps. They spell out some of the steps, people try them and fail. Um, and the way that I'm relating this cake pop back to accessibility is I bet that this ugly cake pop tastes really good. It probably tastes good, it just looks ugly. What often happens with design systems is the opposite, where people will copy your CSS. They'll copy your CSS and they'll copy your, say, like your animations, but they won't copy sort of the underlying thinking that went into using that CSS or like why, like why are you using that animation in a particular place? Why are you using this style in a particular place? And they're not gonna copy your HTML markup necessarily. So someone might, again, have something with a button class looks like a button, acts like a button with a mouse, but is secretly a div behind the scenes and isn't accessible. Um, so include accessibility notes in your documentation. This is like the most important step, I think, after you make things accessible, is educating people about how it's accessible, why it's accessible, and how they can do that as well. Um, so again, another plug for Lightning. Um, I used to work at Salesforce and I was on the accessibility team there and I worked really closely with the design systems team to make sure that our components there were accessible. And one of the things that I did uh, along with a few other people is write accessibility documentation for each component. So here we've got the avatar component um, which has an image in it with an alt attribute and the very first section of the component documentation is about accessibility and how to use alt attributes for images. Um, Bootstrap, again, everyone in the world uses Bootstrap apparently. Um, Bootstrap has some very long documentation for their icons and a whole line item here is about accessible icons and they talk about using ARIA attributes. And I think it's really, really important that they're talking about ARIA there because a lot of times developers who are new to, co new to front end coding might see this sort of ARIA prefix on an attribute and be like, oh, I don't need that, and they'll get rid of it. They won't realize that the ARIA attributes are really essential for screen reader users and um, voice control users, people who are navigating with assistive technology. Um, here's just another example of Bootstrap's um, documentation. So when you're writing accessibility documentation, I highly encourage writing component level documentation the way that Salesforce is doing it, Bootstrap, um, I saw 18F does this, a lot of style guides are doing this. So pessimistically, what I like about component documentation is it discourages people from removing all of the accessible goodies that you've put in the code. But optimistically, it also encourages people to pay constant attention to accessibility. If they see an accessibility note on every single page of your uh, documentation, they're gonna know that accessibility is something they should be thinking about all the time. It's something they should bake in and not tack on at the end. And it just generally spreads best practices. Maybe someone won't use your particular tab set component. They'll go off and build their own, but they'll know how to make it accessible because you talked about it. I've also seen a lot of style guides using general documentation for accessibility. So this is commonly, if you think about the common model of having, you know, your, your right hand side navigation for your style guide, normally the accessibility line item is at the very bottom of that navigation, which is a little bit scary for me because it kind of, again, sort of reinforces that accessibility 
is something to think about at the end of the process, which is not the case, and people might not know to go there. So I really like general accessibility documentation. I think it's really useful to have that on your, in your style guide because it encourages this holistic thinking about inclusive design, about including people, the, the experiences of people with disabilities from the very beginning. But if you're going to have general documentation, you should use it in conjunction with this like component level documentation. Um, another example of the Salesforce things, I think Brandon talked about this yesterday, is um, this Lightning Design System doesn't include JavaScript, but a really important part of accessible components like modals, for instance, is the interactivity. So this is the modal, modal accessibility documentation in the Lightning Design System. It's got a general paragraph about like general interactivity. Um, it's got a bullet pointed list of the expected HTML markup followed by a bullet pointed list of the expected keyboard interactions. So it's not just saying, here's how to write the HTML and the CSS for this, it's also saying, and here are the interactions that say a keyboard user would expect that a screen reader user would expect. Um, so to kind of recap our cooking class, there are four big things that you should think about. First, bake accessibility in from the very beginning. Second, use key ingredients of semantic HTML, alternative text for images, um, ARIA when you need it. The first rule of ARIA is actually to not use ARIA, but use it when you absolutely need to use it, um, and keyboard interactivity. In, think about color and think about accessibility with color. Don't see accessibility as kind of a barrier to making things fun. Think about ways that you can make things fun for every type of user, regardless of their abilities, and spread your accessible recipes generously. Um, and that's what I got for you. Yay. <laughs>there's so much good stuff in there. One of them, a point you made early on in the, was that uh, maybe accessibility or could just be not just um, making it work, but making it work like uh, that's enjoyable to use mm -hmm. as well, which is so cool, right? I, uh, like, could you, do you think of an example of that? Not just like, oh, you know, like, the, I don't know, for sighted users, it's cool and has this cool animation, but we made it just basically bleh, work with accessibility. But that's, it's like not as fun. It's like a degraded, crappier version, the accessibility one. Yeah, or like I was thinking about, you know, those Slack notifications um, since we got that great talk on voice and tone yesterday. Like, what if those read out to a screen reader user when they got to that page? So that's just including people in on the fun. Um, I'm trying to think of examples of specifically making things great yeah. for, but, but right. I, I think the main thing is whenever you are creating like a fun or enjoyable experience, everyone should be able to take part in that. And there shouldn't actually be separate experiences. Like a lot of websites have separate like accessibility modes, which is like a huge no-no because it means that probably, oh, really? yeah. Turn on accessibility mode. Yeah, and people no think good. that will, people think, oh, that'll be like a better experience, but it's actually super bad because um, people who turn on that mode might not get all of the same features, like that mode will get really neglected really quickly. Uh, it's so, like almost, it's like a recipe for a second class citizen out of, exactly. yeah. Yeah, so just think about ways to inject like whimsy and fun, like the, the Facebook example of those animations popping up um, for everyone. Right, it was, yeah. it was thought about, yeah, yeah, that's kind of fun. I wonder if it's, it, when I thought of it, I was like, I wonder if it's a way to like trick trick someone like me into into having more fun with it rather than you know being like oh i guess i got to do the accessibility part now which like it or not some some of us feel like that you know and then and then it was like well not only can i do it but i'm going to take this opportunity to do something fun or like i don't know i'm going to think about this experience and kick it up a notch and yeah, yeah um and I, like creating keyboard experiences, for instance, I have in the past like gotten some pushback of people being like, why do we need to make something keyboard accessible? But as soon really? as we make it keyboard accessible, then everyone's like, wow, I actually really like using this with the keyboard. I use it with the keyboard all the time instead of my mouse, right. even though I can use my mouse. You trained yourself yeah, a little like, bit. Yeah, like it's yeah. faster to use my tab, keyboard tab, tab, to tab, do tab, this. Tab, tab, tab. Or not even tab, but like oh. special, special keyboard shortcuts for different types of interactions. It makes it a lot better for literally everyone. So you're adding those um, keyboard shortcuts for people who really need them, but then everyone benefits. Mm -hmm.
Okay, cool. Um, there's a good little CSS trick in there that I was that I was attracted to was that that I think a few people in the audience picked up on was the it's so easy to make and we've talked a lot in other talks about classing things. Mm -hmm. Just there's a class and it's a button, so I'm gonna of course I'm gonna make the class button or SLDS button or or, or whatever. But it's like that gives us then the power to make literally anything a button and a, just a just a tr tricky sneaky way to keep people from doing that is to enforce. And enforce using the proper element. So button dot button, use the element selector and the class selector. That's pretty, that's clever stuff. You, yeah, you, I know it's a little contentious though because people don't really like putting, you know, elements in HTML like that. But I think it's really useful for accessibility. Yeah, I mean, I can see minor, minorly yeah. contentious being like, don't, you know, it's increased the specificity by one microbe. Yeah, you can also write linters for that kind of stuff too if you don't want to increase specificity. Oh, I, yeah. Oh, yeah. Speaking of that kind of thing, though, is there is there tooling that you use or the Dropbox uses to to pay? like what 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 does it take to like ship something at Dropbox? Does it got to go through you? Do you have a process like that? I'd like it to eventually. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, so I'm actually I'm fairly new at Dropbox, so mm -hmm. I'm working on building out tooling right now. Um, but yeah, I have a set of manual guidelines that I like people to go through because mm -hmm. um, you can write a lot of accessibility tests for this um, and I'm working on that kind of stuff, like automated tests, but a lot of it is also the human experience. Again, like you don't wanna just check boxes of, yes, every single button is a button, like you do wanna check that. Yeah. But you also wanna check that the experience is it's good. More than so, heuristics or yeah, whatever. Yeah, so I tell people like, go through the feature you're working on with a keyboard. Is it cumbersome? Do you ever get stuck? A lot of times when a modal pops up, your focus doesn't go into that modal and that's really difficult for people. Yeah, f yeah. literal focus. Like, yeah, you're, yeah. yeah, so if a modal pops up and you press tab and you're just tabbing around behind everything behind the modal, that's not really fun. Yeah, um, I and can that's, imagine that's a tough one. That's like, it's yeah. probably, I mean, how many apps have modals? Like all of them? Every one of yeah. them. Yeah, <laughs> right. And most of them are not accessible. Yeah, so what, what's the trick? Like, uh, I guess we don't, have to, we don't have to mouth JavaScript, but... <laughs> But yeah, Something I, like select the first element and trigger focus on it. If you Google, there's a really good code sample online. I think it's called the incredible accessible modal. Oh. Um, yeah, so it's really incredible. It's really, it's really rad and awesome. <laughs> it's a real rock star ninja modal. <laughs> I love it. But I do, I do love, I highly recommend looking up this this resource, yeah. Uh, you talked about focus halos a bunch, the the blue one that, you know, I think I saw some tweets of people who were like, ooh, guilty of that one, removing it because of, because of its ugliness factor or whatever, and then mentioned, God, you can do anything you want there. You could add a background image. There's lots of possibilities for a, for a focus style. Have you ever heard anyone say, do they, I mean, do, I can imagine there people have different opinions about this, like they do everything else on Earth. But is there any pushback on like just leave it alone? I like the, the most people leave it alone. Just give me the blue. I like the blue. The blue is consistent. The blue is a, a thing. Or is it just like oh, they, they actually took the opportunity to do some cool delight there? You know, have you heard both sides of that one? I think consistency is really important there. So like if you are defining your own one, um, like keeping that style consistent across your entire website. Like at Dropbox, we have a slight variation on the default blue halo where we have like the Dropbox blue halo, um, uh. which is a little bit less fuzzy. So there are a bunch of, I haven't really gotten pushback on like removing the focus halo and replacing it with something new. It's more about just making sure there's something visual there, regardless of what it is. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it reminds me of things like don't you know leave form styles default because that's already used to it, or links should be blue because they were in 1996 yeah. or whatever that. I agree with the form styles thing for yeah. select, but can I can I do a little yeah. tiny rant here uh -huh. about custom select elements? So a lot of people like uh -huh. Is don't the rant like no. <laughs> yeah, the, well the rant is make it accessible. So like a lot of people don't like the default select. Um, drop down because it's not styleable with CSS. So people will replace it with a bunch of divs or hopefully list items because at least that's a little bit better. But they don't include, a lot of times they don't include the keyboard functionality or they'll include the keyboard right. functionality but not use ARIA on it. So if I were a screen reader user trying to navigate up and down this select, it's not going to read out the options to me the way that a native one would. So I would say like, Use the default select element. I know it's kind of ugly, but it's also standard across the web, so I think Isn't people there, are used like, to it. We could make a checklist. There's probably like 100 things that it gives you for free that you don't even think about, right? Yeah. The fact that it like opens up if it's towards the bottom, and the fact that you can type like W and it goes to the W things. Yeah. And yeah, there's like all this stuff that you get for free that would be a pain in the butt to. It's really hard to reproduce that with to JavaScript. To do properly, yeah.
Uh, I think somebody in the, I mean, regarded to tooling, I guess we could, we already talked about it a little bit because you, you wish you could do more or whatever, but uh, it would be kind of neat to, to figure out how, how to like tie in tooling to th things that a lot of us use like continuous integration or whatever. As soon as somebody pushes or somebody commits to master or whatever, it runs some accessibility yeah. suite kind of thing. Yeah. That would be neat, yeah. And a lot of people, a lot of companies build that in house, um, but there are also like a lot of open source tools and non open source tools for that. Um, so you can just like Google accessibility yeah. automation. Um, Tenon is a really cool framework, um, tenon.io, that is specifically built for accessibility testing um, as part of continuous integration. It's really useful. Tenon. Tenon. Got it. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned accessibility, I mean, from the top to bottom of your talk, it was kind of like sometimes accessibility or oftentimes accessibility is treated as this tack on thing. I mean, that was the blueberry muffin thing. But even, even in documentation for a style guide, it can be like, here's how you use it, yada, yada, yada. Oh, also, it's accessible maybe if you do this kind of thing. And that yeah. is that, that's, again, a second class citizen, citizen yeah. of, of uh, which is undesirable, hey? Yeah, so accessibility, first class citizen. And like, I've had, a lot of people are, are scared of accessibility at first because they think it'll be a lot of extra work or it'll make things worse, but every single time that I've worked with someone on making something more accessible, at the end of it, they're like, oh, wow, that's really cool. Like, it now yeah. works better for me, even though I didn't think that I ne needed or wanted accessibility functionality built in. Yeah. Right, it ends up being better than you thought it was going yeah. to. Yeah. I remember reading a post like years ago that was like the alphabet of accessibility or something. You're familiar no, with that? Like I'm it's not. Any, but it's fun cool. that it's not because a lot of times you think accessibility equals screen reader or accessibility. Yeah. And I'm sure you're well aware that it's it's more than that. It's like people with a broken arm and people exactly. with you know that are happen to be wearing an eye patch at or the moment. Or people who are outside on a sunny day looking at their phone and like I can't see this thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it was kind of just a fun thing of of reminding people that it's not just like it's for blind people only, you know, yeah. it's a, <laughs> yeah. um, is there, do you have an example of like one of those and, and a way that you solve for it or something like, um, a, an, like an unusual accessibility issue that you, hmm. that's okay. An I didn't mean to put you, accessibility a, issue. but the sun one was a good one. So you yeah, already kind of hit it. Yeah, the sun one or, yeah, or like the other day I was working, or I personally have like migraines with aura, which are kind of frightening things that when I get a migraine, like I can't see out of half of my eye. So sometimes I do use a screen reader mm -hmm. um, and I feel like fortunate that I am in accessibility and know how to use a screen reader. But if I didn't use a screen reader, like I also like sometimes will increase text, you know, and that's yeah. something that's really, really common. Um, my, and this also speaks to like, getting accessibility features kind of surfaced as like top level features. Like my grandmother sends me emails in all caps and she <laughs> does that because the text is easier for her to see in all caps and she doesn't know they that should have she grandma can... mode when you receive it, that yeah. lower cases. Oh, that would be cool. But yeah, like she doesn't know that she can press like command plus plus or whatever to, yeah. to increase her font size. So she does what works for her. Is it, you mentioned that you you are in accessibility, so you know how to use screen readers. I, I, that's a moment of frustration that I've faced as well. It's like I'm gonna I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna test this thing in a screen reader because I know that I should or whatever. I turn voice over on it. I'm like, oh, it's so hard. I don't know what to do. You know? Like, did you have what's the like? What was the learning curve like for you? Are like are you like wicked proficient in voice? Oh, I'm not, and I know that I'm not, and yeah. I know I don't use a screen reader nearly as well as someone who uses it yeah. all the time. And so I'm constantly learning new techniques for how to do it. Um, some of my like blind colleagues in accessibility have like taught me things where I'm like, oh my gosh, I didn't know that feature existed. Yeah. But that's really, I was having a conversation yesterday with my friend Shannon, who's in the audience, about screen readers specifically and people who may go blind later on in life. And they have to learn this technology really fast and it's hard. Um, so there's definitely some work to do there around ramping people up. But they're also good, like with voiceover, Apple has pretty good documentation around it. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. we'll check that yeah. out. Hey, thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm.